Welcome to uh, 35 Fedora releases in about 30 minutes. I have timed this talk and gotten it in 30 minutes, but I have to talk really fast. So I asked for more time here so that I could talk a little bit more slowly. I still will try and go very fast. Um, it will, won't be comprehensive even with that, but we should have the ability to hit some important highlights in the history of the Fedora project and some questions after. And I think uh, hopefully this will be fun for people who have gone through all of this, uh, informative to people who are newer in the project and or just interested. And I think there are some lessons that we've learned along the way that hopefully we can not repeat our own mistakes and we can maybe other people can learn from them. Dan, all heckling should go later at the end of the talk. I have a slide on that later. You'll, you'll, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as I said, heckling should be saved for the end. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, this is me. Um, no time to explain. If you don't know me, um, come talk to me later. I'll be happy to. Um, but you know, I'm from the internet and stuff. Uh, I have 85 slides here, so I'm going to try and get through them. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about the history of Red Hat Linux and uh, the split to RHEL and all of that. Uh, that's a whole nother talk, um, somebody else's talk. I wasn't, I wasn't there for the behind the scenes, so um, this is going to start with Fedora Core 1. Uh, this is the basic format of the slides, um, release name and number at the top, a little bits of information around. Um, since I'm showcasing like the desktop wallpaper over here is kind of a visual focus on things, um, desktop's always been important to Fedora, uh, but it isn't the only case. A lot of people are using Fedora for server use cases, for other things, for IoT and small devices. There's a lot of non-desktop cases as well, so those shouldn't be left out, but you know, there's the visual flair of the wallpaper, so that's kind of a big thing. Um, I have the kernel version over here. Um, and things like that, system, like which init system is there, kind of to put some technical things in there. Um, the actual number, like that's not important. Uh, over here on events, that's our big headline events. We've always had a lot of different smaller events in Fedora as well. Those aren't listed. Uh, Fedora activity days, Fedora women's day, that kind of thing. Um, and then I also have most active on the devel list. That's kind of a way to kind of get some people's names up on the screen. You may recognize some of those names as we go through. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's you know the most productive person that that release, but um, you know um, some, sometimes it is. Um, and it, uh, yeah, there are also obviously a lot of quieter people who've done lots of work who don't get shown up here, and a lot of people who deserve credit. I also put the Fedora project leader's name up there, which means my name will show up a lot. Doesn't mean I am the most important person, but you know um, yeah, I, I get to be the face of things. So there it is. Um, here at the bottom, I have from some of my metrics the release popularity over time. It's a little bit of a spoiler here, um, but uh, we'll go, go through that as we go. And then um, some pop culture things there just for reference as well. All right, um, I'll take a sip of water because here we go. So you have flowers in a pond here, nice quiet beginning for the background here. Uh, so this is Fedora Core 1, and it was really basically what would have been uh, Red Hat Linux 10 if that had been produced. So it was basically made entirely inside Red Hat with the same mechanisms. Uh, it wasn't really a community release. It was open source, but all developed internally. Um, it's basically just the name Fedora Core put on what would have been a pretty nice Fedora, uh, Red Hat Linux release. Um, and then there was extras, which were a collection of add-ons that you, know, you could basically put on top of it. Um, and that was like that, the community was welcome to maintain these extras on top of that. Um, but actually, during this release, a really important key thing happened, which I think kind of set the tone for the project overall. So uh, AMD 64, 64-bit extensions for Intel architecture were brand new, and it was kind of a server class, like enterprise feature, and so Red Hat was thinking, That'll be a differentiator. RHEL will have 64-bit, Fedora will be 32-bit, and we'll, you know, people will obviously want to pay for that distinction. There was a lot of worry about how people will understand like, why to pay for RHEL, why it's different from Fedora at the time, so they were really looking for these differentiators. But then someone in the community, uh, actually Justin Forbes, who's still kernel maintainer in Fedora now, uh, went and just you know, uh, working from uh, uh, under his desk in, in Texas, I think, uh, went and just uh, rebuilt everything for x86-64, built a version of it, 
And so uh, I wasn't there, I didn't work for Red Hat at the time, but as I understand it, this caused a lot of you know, head, like, people were unsure what to do. What, you know, should this be allowed? Should anything, you know, be, should we say anything about it or whatever? But eventually, uh, the decision you know, from Red Hat was, okay, well look, this Fedora community people are doing this, we should, we should accept this, and so it actually became part of, you know, it actually officially released at some point as a 64-bit version of Fedora. Um, and I think that kind of set things both for multiple different architectures and just for you know, the, the Fedora community as an independent, uh, not just uh, the community doing add-ons, but something you know, can actually make fundamental change in, in the project. And that was a really key early thing. Uh, also, I want to point out the logo here, which is a little red hat thing, which is um, funny to me because we're not supposed to use hats in Fedora for, um, again, that differentiator reason, which is funny because, you know, Fedora. And also, um, it looks like Red Hat's new logo that they, after much, much expense, uh, changed the Shadow Man thing back to this little icon here. Uh, so the next one, um, Tetnang, there's a complicated process by which these names are derived and they have to relate to the other one, and I've explained up at the top what the connection theoretically is there. Uh, this is basically another, like what would have been a Red Hat Linux release. Uh, it actually looks very much the same. There were some important technical changes under the hood. Uh, had the 2.6 kernel, back then that was a big jump. And SE Linux was enabled. Um, Dan Walsh is here in the corner. He can do a talk about that. Um, uh, right, I actually have in my notes, that's a whole nother talk, and Dan Walsh is the one for that talk. Right? Um, but yeah, the big question here is, what does this community stuff mean? Is it like, can, how involved is the community here? And so actually a lot of people talked to me about this uh, IRC, uh, like it was actually an email mimicking a chat log here that uh, Mr. Icon, uh, Konstantin Rubetsev, uh, sort of sent to show like this is how people are feeling. Redheaders don't seem to get it, but like it doesn't really, we don't know how the community is gonna engage here. So um, yeah, uh, in the release announcement here, like it's you know, kind of presented by Red Hat here. Um, it, it, it isn't quite clear what um, the open source community as executive producer, it says in the release announcement, like what does this mean? Um, so yeah, um, from, from the outside, as a community member who was interested in this stuff, it was all pretty frustrating. Um, people who are involved in CentOS and seeing CentOS stream and Red Hat's communication struggles with that may experience some deja vu with this. Um, it's the same kind of thing in a lot of ways. Okay, so FC3. Um, this one's a little bit of progress. It says in the release announcement, I don't have the release announcement up there. Nope, I don't. But it, it says the Fedora project and Red Hat would like to announce rather than Red Hat announcing. Um, but the core is really still an all of a Red Hat thing. Um, there were some things happening. The Fedora extras, the add-ons were actually now, you could get them from the same download server. It wasn't a whole different thing. Um, there wasn't actually a central build system. The build system was you would send your spec file your, uh, to Seth Vidal and he would build it for you and then put it there. Um, but you know, things are happening. There's like four times as many packages in extras as there were before. So people were kind of coming together and working on that. Um, then FC4, same wallpaper. It's the only time we've ever duplicated the wallpaper and it's kind of a boring wallpaper too, so oh, uh, oh well. Um, this release was, I think, the worst, probably the worst, the worst ever. Um, it took forever to show up, and SE Linux was in a horrible state. It wasn't, it wasn't usable. It was very frustrating. Um, reviews were like, this is all about features, and no one cares about stability. This is, you know, uh, all the, it, it was probably all true. Um, also, the release engineering process wasn't very good, and actually there were changes, like midway through this long thing, which meant that you, couldn't install it anymore. You had to install the original one and then do a bunch of updates. Like it was a whole horrible thing. Um, but there was a lot of exciting community things going on. I may be biased here because I personally helped organize the first Fedora conference, the Fedora user and developer conference in Boston. And I think that was actually, again, I'm biased, but I really think that was an important turning point because it was a lot of you know, Red Hat people came and a lot of people who weren't Red Hatters and it all felt um, collaborative and friendly and fun and there was no like Red Hatters telling people what was going on. It was Red Hat you know, engineers who kind of talking to other people in the community and trying to figure out and deciding what we're gonna 
do and you know, people in the community presenting about how they wanted it to go and it kind of felt exciting and collaborative. So that was a really, really nice moment there, I think. I'm really fond of this background. I, I don't know, I, um, I'm not a graphic designer, but I looked at this and I'm like, oh, look how fancy that is. It's so, I don't know, somebody who has an artist made this one. Uh, so I, an artist made the other ones too, that's not fair. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I, so graphic designery, I guess, I, I like it. Um, so the big news with this release really is a story about Yum, which you know, the precursor to DNF, now the, the uh, meta package manager. So before this, in the olden days, like there was just RPM, and if you wanted to update your system, um, you basically had to download a bunch of packages and hope you got all the dependencies, and it was a whole mess. So there were some tools that you developed to do that, and Red Hat had a huge investment in a thing called Red Hat Network and Up to Date which I think was just discontinued like several years ago. But um, it was supposed to be, like this was gonna be again a monetization thing. This was gonna be the product and they put a lot of effort into it. And, and then meanwhile, people, um, you know, Seth Vidal took this thing uh, that is an open source uh, project and uh, put it into Fedora that did this uh, idea of rather than just having to download themselves, it would actually like figure out what you needed to do an update and retrieve all of the things and get them from the mirrors and uh, do it in a kind of a nice polished way. So you could actually have, you'd just run an update and it would update your system. It was amazing. And so again, as I understand it, there was some inside Red Hat like consternation about this. Should we allow this thing? What should we do with it? You know, it got put into Fedora and then uh, eventually Red Hat realized, okay, this is actually better than the thing we have tried to develop internally, and it ended up going into RHEL and being the update system for RHEL as well, which was a huge kind of thing as well. There was a letting go of the not invented here uh, mentality and say, okay, like the innovation can come from the community. It doesn't have to be something that we've designed at Red Hat, even if it was something that was like contrary to where we thought we were going with our business plans, we're gonna take a leap with this and figure out how to, how to work with it. So that was, really important. Um, although, still, like Red Hat has this director control, I think, in the release announcement that <laughs> may have talked about that kind of thing again. All the decisions for engineering, those were Red Hat internal decisions made kind of, I don't know, I imagine some sort of shadowy back room, uh, but actually not. Um, <laughs> but um, One funny thing happened here when this release came out, uh, that all the Fedora systems were on the same network as Red Hat. Red Hat was a small company at the time, and the release was on like an end of quarter, some sort of important business day, and all the downloads for this totally broke the network and ruined everything. <laughs> and uh, Mike McGrath tells the story better than I can. Mike McGrath is now the uh, VP of Linux or something, maybe even fancier title than that now. Uh, Big cheese, says Dan, yeah. And at the time, he was the Fedora infrastructure lead, but he didn't work for Red Hat. He was a community volunteer. He worked for a different company in Chicago, um, and he was you know, the main, main sysadmin. Uh, and uh, the CEO of Red Hat at the time called in the FPL and was like, who did this? You need to get your, your, your system as men networking people right in here. And so then Max Spivak explained, well, um, I could, but, you know, he's in Chicago, and also I can't tell him to do anything. He doesn't work for us, doesn't work for you. Um, so uh, at that point, very shortly, I guess Mike was hired um, and then told, told to fix the problem. So uh, <laughs> I don't know, that's, that's one way to get a job. Um, we also, this is where the uh, now classic actual Fedora logo was designed. This was actually made by like a brand, brand consulting um, thing, and it took uh, these ideas, like the, the Red Hat marketing, Red Hat marketing used to actually like do marketing stuff for Fedora, and they came up with the slogan of Infinity Freedom Voice, and that's where this, you know, the infinite, this come together to make the classic logo there. Uh, I have some fondness for it, but um, yeah. Uh, here, uh, this is a wallpaper that a lot of people love when I was talking about that people like really, oh, that 3D underwater rendered one. Wow, this is one of people's favorites here. Uh, people also like the name Zod. Uh, it was a whole in-joke thing. Uh, we've got lots of in-jokes, but uh, this release actually happened on exactly the day that my second daughter was born. So I don't remember much about this or several months after of that um, personally, but you know, I went back and looked. Um, there was still a lot of time happening between releases, 218 days, that's a lot more than six months. Um, 
There's a whole long story about why there was no Fedora Foundation. That's probably also a whole nother talk. Um, but at this point, uh, the Fedora Board became an official governance body. Before that, there was a thing called the Fedora Advisory Board, which was really just a mailing list where anybody could give opinions and nobody made any decisions or get whatever. But they actually uh, con they made a you know, constitution for the project that had the Fedora Board as the governing body for it. Um, it was a mix of people who are elected by the community and appointed by the FPL. Um, and the Fedora project leader had veto power over this, the structure there. Um, and now finally, we actually have a mirror manager system, which let me get accounts. So you can start seeing the statistics starting to happen at the bottom of the page there. Um, yeah. uh, another nice wallpaper there, Moonshine. Um, so this is a, a big thing here was core and extras got merged together. So having that split, um, not only was it starting to be kind of actually problematic practically, it was you know, showing it, it, all the frustration in the community and the stress between like who can do what and so on. So Red Hat made another big decision. Again, a lot of a lot of fighting with um, the uh, yeah, internal wrangling that I'm not I don't know all the details of. But eventually, the decision was made. We're going to merge these things together into one unified project. We're not going to have this core and extra split anymore. Uh, and it actually turned out to be easier to move all the stuff from inside to extras, so basically core got merged into extras, extras became the thing, and core went away, and it became a, a unified release. Um, this is also the first release with live images. Uh, Fedora wasn't the first distro to do that, but it goes way back to this. Um, cool. Uh, also, at FUDCon we had, again in Boston there, we talked about this new file system called ButterFS. I uh, thought, should we make that to default? And at the time, we decided, well, it's going to be about two more years before that's ready. So in about two more years, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Werewolf. Um, so seven was where these were brought together. But eight was really the first um, community collaborative release. This really felt like this was, in some ways, this is actually the first Fedora Linux, because it was not just. Um, it, it not just released as a unified thing, but it was actually you know, planned and put together as in, in the open as a community project. So this was a really fundamental release here. Uh, this is where the feature process, which we now call the changes process, or change process. Uh, ben Cotton wants me to say it one way or the other, and I cannot remember. I'm sorry, Ben, um, plural or not. Uh, so that, that was introduced, and basically um, the idea is not that we should have a big bureaucracy, but stop surprising each other with changes. If you're going to do something big, let's talk about it first and what impact that will have. It's not meant to slow things down or stop, but just make sure that we're all talking together so that uh, we can you know, make things work the best they can. Um, this was a very, very popular release. There are still at least 100 systems out there checking into the mirrors every day um, to see if we will release any more updates for this, just, just in case. Um, I, I enjoy that. Um, we also, this is where the idea of Fedora Spins came out. A spin is kind of a uh, version where instead of just, you know, this is like the official um, one desktop release, you'd have different ways of putting together the, the software into a different, you know, different desktop, different installation. I think this is something that's kind of fundamental to what's interesting about Fedora as a distribution. We really try to, instead of saying, oh, you wanted to make it different, well, you can fork it and make your own project that's based on it. We say, hey, come into the project if you wanted to make you know, your different version of it that works this way. Cool, we, have, we can try and find a space for you to do that. Um, this wallpaper was the first one, I think, with a time of day feature, so it changes over time. Um, this is the evening version here. Sulfur. Um, the features process brings us new features, I guess. Um, we had a new init system here. Uh, so this is an, another really interesting story. So init system is you know, after the, the kernel boots. It is the thing that, that brings up everything else and responsible for making, all your ser making sure all your services are running, on desktop, the desktop starts, all of those kind of things. And so the old thing, um, system 5 init script, system v, I don't know. I'm, uh, some, somebody can correct me on that later. Um, but uh, that basically used a bunch of shell scripts that were kind of sh slow and buggy and inconsistent. So um, at the FUDCon, which was, I think, in Raleigh that time, uh, a guy named Casey Dolan stood up and was like, hi, um, my name's Casey. I'm going to replace the init system. If you want to stop me, come to my talk. 
Um, and so people came, and I guess no one, no one ended up stopping him. So Casey was an intern at Red Hat. He, so he was a Red Hatter, but he wasn't, this wasn't his job. It was just something he was kind of doing for fun. Um, he wasn't working on the OS at all. Uh, so this is kind of a community-led improvement. Um, replaced it with, uh, did I say here, Upstart here is the, is the system that was used there. Um, and so that was an interesting thing that also I think went into RHEL releases. is an improvement coming from the community that um, wasn't something that was started as a Red Hat decision there. Um, Cambridge. Um, Cambridge was actually going to be, as I understand it, the code name for the what would have been the Red Hat Linux 10 release. So there was some wrangling to get it to be the Fedora 10 release behind the scenes, even though nominally there's that link there. That's actually the real reason this is called Cambridge. Uh, this release is important, I think, because this is where the Fedora foundations came from. There was that Infinity Freedom Voice that had been, you know, basically somebody external to the project invented that and thought that would be nice, it, which it's fine. Um, and it's nice to have that support, but uh, it didn't really reflect, you know, who we are as Fedora. And so there was some work on, you know, talking about who are we as a community, and out of it, these four foundations, which we still kind of use as our guiding principles today. Freedom, friends, features, and first um, were there. So I think that's uh, nice. That was, um, yeah, I think uh, Paul Freels helped finalize that, and I think Max Spivak as FPL really just started just down that road there. Uh, yeah, this is a special wallpaper. I actually never had seen this lion before, before I went and did this. You had to have two monitors and a widescreen. The lion didn't show up unless you had the second monitor there. Uh, so, uh, yes. uh, so this is the, those the uh, icons for the four foundations. Um, and also around this time, we did talk about ButterFS again and decided it's probably gonna be ready in about two years. So, so. Um, and uh, this is actually, it took us um, exactly 196 days, two releases in a row here for this one. Okay, I'm gonna go kind of fast through the next few ones here. Um, we had the first BudCon in South America. This is, this is a pretty nice but boring release, which boring can sometimes be good. Um, uh, here, uh, I have a note that we had a beautiful new website, and I also see that I did not take a screenshot of the website, but of Wikipedia. Um, this is actually not my screenshot. I stole the screenshot from Wikipedia. Stole, there's CC license information at the end of this talk. It's not stolen at all. <laughs> I uh, took. Um, but uh, yeah, um, a, lot, a lot of stuff going on, but um, that, uh, this wallpaper, very dramatic, and um, I got a lot of people like, is my screen broken um, on this one? I, I, we had the, I, I love our um, community process that develops wallpapers, but for some reason there's a tendency to make things that look like a broken LCD screen. Um, and this one got, got through here, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, so behind the scenes in this release, Jesse Keating, who was the release engineer at the time, did a big thing of switching everything over from using CVS as our version control to Distgit. So that was a lot of big work there, um, which is actually pretty neat technology at the time because Git does not do a good job at storing large binaries. So um, that's like, you know, at the time, you know, Git was starting to take off in popularity, but there wasn't like everything is on the Git Forge somewhere. There are people's various things everywhere. So just like today, our primary like way of packaging things is getting the official tarball, and so you have this official you know, downloaded binary somewhere, and those couldn't really be stuck into Git. So he has a clever system for that. It's all pretty neat. Um, it, was, it was innovative things coming from. Uh, from Fedora, and I think Jesse got a job at GitHub uh, on the strength of all this work. So that's, uh, um, and then also uh, because in that transition, we, uh, there's we, I say we, but I don't know, uh, so Jesse, probably somebody made a tool called Fed Package that basically, instead of using the CVS commands, uh, it kind of abstracted all the package managing things, so it didn't really matter what transition you were making, what, what you're using underneath. And we still use that Fed Package tool a lot as well, and it kind of, hide some of the implementation details. And I think that's actually also kind of a nice lesson because change is hard. Um, so yeah, you can see, we've, you know, it's not like in, in huge growth here, but we've got a nice growing growth trend around there. Things are going really well. Um, yeah, uh, so um, this really lovely wallpaper for this release. Um, this release is gonna be great, right? I hear laughter from the audience here, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, uh oh. Um, 
uh, goodbye to half our users here. Um, so there's not enough time to talk about you know, uh, what, what, whether, whether System D or GNOME are good. That's, we, can, we could have a, like a whole like yelling fight about that. Um, but uh, yeah, this was a lot of change all at once. And um, I think you know, if you look at these technologies today, I think they're good. This was, this was the right choice to go in this direction. But wow, uh, they were not ready, and people were not ready. And we actually, I w went back and looked, and I was like, well, could we have documented things better? Like, how could it, we actually put a lot of work into making this smooth. There were videos about all this, and it was like, we tried, but it was just too much change. Um, I think, you know, in retrospect, like that Fed package tool, if we would have like worked on some things for compatibility and done some user experience things and whatever, it would have been a much better experience. Um, and it's always kind of a trade-off. So one of the problems with that, like, we'd switched to upstart as an init system before, but uh, there was so much emphasis on making it compatible that basically, um, not only did you not notice any of the change, we ended up just keep writing the same shell scripts for it, and we ever, never took advantage of any of the possible improvements from it. So there's something where uh, if you're focused too much on the compatibility, it can hold you back. So going ahead is sometimes important, but um, maybe let's not do it this way again, because that was not great. Uh, this wallpaper, obviously a reference to Jules Verne and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, but I kind of can't help but feeling that the just sort of murky depths and gloom was just kind of the feeling, the, as my kids say, the vibe uh, of, of the project at the time, and it was you know, kind of depressing, and uh, so we got a depressing wallpaper here. Um, Jared Smith, who's the FPL, said oh, yeah, that was the awkward teenage years. Um, so, yeah, that made me something to it. Uh, what? D did I? What? Architectures? There's, what did, wait. Uh, oh, there was, yeah, sorry, I'll fix my slide later. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know why we dropped. Uh, it, it, yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> the comment from the audience was I've accidentally left ARM off the list here, and I should not. Um, but um, yeah, um, we did consider ButterFS as the default file system uh, this time, and um, yeah, uh, we considered, we decided in maybe another about two years that's going to be going to be ready. Um, there was actually one big important change that happened here. Before this, Fedora had a uh, contributor uh, license agreement where basically you said that you were giving you know, the right, your license rights to Red Hat to control. And since at this point, and since that, we've changed to a uh, contributor agreement, which basically says, I've got the right to submit this code, and it's under an open source license, and um, if it doesn't have an explicit license, you can treat it like it has MIT or C uh, Creative Commons license. So it's, it's not a thing that gives away any rights. And so that was a change that um, I think made the, made being a contributor, not working at Red Hat, uh, to Fedora, much more equitable. There are a lot of open source projects which have a thing where you have to assign your rights to the, to the company or to some entity that works on it. And often, uh, that's kind of a, a unilateral thing where uh, everybody outside of the special entity is bound by copyleft. It means you know, if you make a contribution, that contribution can be shared with anybody and so on, whereas the entity can say, oh, I'm licensing this as proprietary software. I'm going to charge a lot for it. Uh, even there, so even your contributions that are GPL for everybody else, for us, they're special. Um, so we, we don't do anything like that, and I think Red Hat doesn't do that for anything. Uh, I think that's pretty important that we got rid of that, and I'm glad we did. Uh, actually, we're even looking at if that contributor agreement is even necessary for a lot of things. Um, we, there's a lot of cases where um, there's a concept called uh, license in, license out. Basically, the assumption that when you're making a patch for something, you know that that's it, you, it's under the right license just by making the, the contribution. Um, but that's for legal to figure out. Um, I would like to point out that on the Devel list here, we have Adam Williamson as both the most uh, prolific thread starter and the most prolific replier to those threads there. Um, I think that's, uh, um, yeah, so things can't all be murky depths here. So we had this release, um, Beefy Miracle. The mustard indicates progress. Um, and the naming process, you, uh, again, you can see that people were not afraid to bend the rules to get what they wanted in this one here. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> uh, missing I'm missing, I'm so sorry that I've dropped the architectures. Well, um, what am I missing now? Oh. I, I think maybe that's supposed to say ARM64 and uh, ARM HFP, okay, whatever. Um, I, I told them to save the heckler. I, I, yeah, I, right, I, I told them to save the heckling for later, but it's not working. Um, <laughs> anyways, many people describe this as their most favorite release overall. And I think, you know, there were a bunch of features, but I think the important thing really was just kind of the camaraderie and the friends foundation of this kind of fun themed release that was very you know, kind of a silly mascot and everything. It kind of, uh, even, even though things felt a little bit depressing, kind of brought everybody together and the community felt like, yeah, we are, um, yeah, we're, we're doing something here. Uh, and so I think that was, that was really a nice moment there. Um, in this release, these tiny dots are actually circles um, because it's an idealized physics problem cow in the name that's in you know, ner nerd jokes in here. Um, this release was kind of a mess, actually. Um, the installer code base, Anaconda, it had gotten kind of horrible and needed some serious refactoring, which it got. Um, but that features process was very geared on what happens release to release. And it turned out that rewriting the whole installer um, was something that needed more than one release to go through. And um, you know, uh, we slipped all the way around from you know, the fall release to January, which was um, not great, to say the least. Um, and also, the Anaconda team that does the installer works on both Fedora and RHEL. And uh, RHEL didn't have a, an upgrade feature. That's actually some being worked on for RHEL right now. But uh, at the time, no upgrade feature. And if it was pretty important to Fedora, but um, oops, somehow that hadn't made the requirements. And at the very last minute, uh, we realized, oh no, there's no way to upgrade. Hey, we kind of need that. So Will Woods threw together something called FedUp, which is a name that I love dearly. I wish we still had that. Um, and uh, this actually is going to kind of accidentally set us on a good path, really, because it actually was a better upgrade process. And from this, we've really worked on making sure that the upgrades are a really smooth process that you don't have to stress out about. It's not a, oh no, um, Fedora's short life cycle means I need to give away about, you know, two weeks of my life every year um, making sure the upgrade works. It's just a, hey, this, run, do the upgrade thing and you'll be on the next release and smooth sailing on. So um, I think it actually, it actually turned out well through serendipity there, but it wasn't, wasn't the intended result. Um, uh, another thing that happened around this time is we had a lot of pain with release engineering, and I will not name names, but um, one person had been doing most of the work for in that area for a number of years and had ended up just from being very overworked, um, you know, the person who knew how to do all the things and no one else did, and also, you know, some amount of pride in that, like, I am the person who knows how to do all these things, which is totally reasonable, and a lot of things in open source are kind of driven by that, like, yeah, I have ownership of this is my thing. Um, but it can also be pretty unhealthy for that person and for the project, so there was a lot of frustration, and I don't blame the person at all. This is a systematic, like, this is a Fedora problem that we hadn't really addressed very well, because we should have found ways to support the person in that and found ways to make sure that they could have that pride in you know, being there in a way that was about the team and the sharing and success of everything. And so that's, uh, but uh, that was, it was definitely causing problems around that time. And that's kind of a thing that has been kind of a repeated theme a little bit here. Uh, yeah, again, we've got nerd jokes here, and these are boxes to put cats in. Um, the problems? Oh, yes, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, here, here you go. Um, so this is a good, the Q QA thing. Um, it turns out that putting Unicode in the name exposed a lot of exciting things everywhere. Um, and actually, um, like having a, I think this was the first name we had a space in it, which actually like, turned out to be worse. Uh, uh, a apostrophe, apostrophe, yeah, right. I think we solved the apostrophe by making it to a Unicode apostrophe. Um, so, uh, yeah, great. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, so all that is kind of fun, but. Um, the biggest thing that happened around this release was really an immense tragedy. So Seth Vidal, who I mentioned before as a really important early contributor to the project, was killed while biking home um, in a hit-and-run driver um, 
Now, Seth was very humble, and he would have downplayed this, but he was so important to uh, making Fedora what it is, both in the community and in technology. Um, when I was a, we were both university sysadmins at different universities, and he helped convince me that um, it was worth the effort to be part of the community and give things back rather than to you know, work on my own and you know, do things there. And um, yeah, he was he was kind, he was funny, he was brilliant, and he was a dear friend. And uh, Seth, we miss you very much. I'm sorry. Um, th this wallpaper, um, th it's a 20, XX for 20 there in the background, very subtle. Uh, th this release had a lot going on. I was actually going to put a picture of myself wearing the 10 Years of Fedora shirt there, but I decided if I was going to cut something out, the vanity could go. Um, the badges aren't actually in that screenshot. I just decided to plaster them there because they're, they're fun. So we launched the Fedora badges gamification thing, which is um, and something we're working on again and kind of putting more central a way to uh, both bring people into the project, find easy ways to get you know, get people hooked in different areas, and also, you know, to uh, some people are very much driven by can I get a digital sticker for doing a thing? So um, we, have, we have digital stickers. It's it's very fun. Um, this is also a place where we decided, you know, we're at the 10 year mark, it's time to do some strategic planning. Um, we'd started out great, and then we had this big drop, um, and now things are kind of you know, taking uh, up again. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the next 10 years um, would, have been, would, be, would be awesome, basically. Uh, so as a flock to a Fedora event, we changed from this FUDCon to this, and the idea, Robin Bergeron, um, my predecessor is the FBL, had this idea that rather than having these little distributed events with um, no real focus, we'd bring everybody in the world together to have a one big event where we would all talk about what we were going to do, plan the next release, and um, bring it together. And so that was a focus of a lot of the strategy there. Um, Tom Calloway, Ruth Seeley did a lot to make that be a reality. Um, I'm somebody's dropping names, and um, I probably shouldn't because I know I'm missing a lot of amazing important people's names in this. So if I've left out a name, I'm sorry, you deserve to have your name mentioned as well. But um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, release engineering comment here. Like this was, this was hard because of all the changes we were making around this. Um, but also um, at this time the Fedora board had kind of faded into the background and kind of become um, there weren't a lot of big decisions to make, but occasionally there was something like, is this open sourcey enough would be raised, and then the board would go off and have a debate and maybe come to a decision and then give a, like, a, like a prophetic announcement that wasn't the question asked, and it wasn't really very functional. So actually FESCO, the Engineering Steering Committee, ended up driving a lot of the strategy work here. Um, this was, uh, yeah, so this thing called Fedora Next, we came out with uh, having you know, different additions. Uh, one of the big problems that had, was kind of causing a lot of stress in the project was uh, the earlier strategy had decided that the desktop release was the, called the default offering. And then uh, we had a lot of people who were contributors in the project, and they mentioned way back at the beginning that there are a lot of people using this in server use cases, not the desktop. Uh, and uh, with, with the desktop being the default, a lot of the decisions were being made, okay, well, that's what we're going to do, we're making a des desktop-oriented decision. And so it ended up that people who had sysadmin interests basically felt like all they could do was complain. That saying, no, 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 was their role in the project. And you know, sysadmins tend towards being grumpy anyways, so <laughs> it was easy to exacerbate that. Uh, so part of the idea here was, let's not do that. Let's give a positive way for um, people who want uh, to have these different use cases to work on Fedora server, work on IoT, work on what are the, you know, these different cloud use cases, and say, OK, you can make the decisions that are right for your use cases and have them, you know, even, even if uh, desktop can also not have to try and say, I'm going to make sure that I placate the server needs for this very different use case for here so we can have these different decisions. So I think that's uh, worked out really well. Um, some of the other things, Fedora rings, not quite there yet, but um, stuff there. Did they get all the architectures right this time, Peter? No. no? Okay, awesome. Did not, <laughs> still, still got the list wrong. Um, May I ask a question? Um, yeah, go ahead. Let's do it. 
uh, that is another talk. <laughs> but the three editions is three editions is what were Fedora Server, Fedora Workstation, and Fedora Cloud at the time. And so we've expanded from that. But that's basically that decision there. Yeah, that's. that's um, um, yeah, so uh, actually, because of the release engineering problems and all that, this is actually, we decided to stop and actually we skipped a release for the first time and probably only time ever um, to kind of give uh, release engineering QA time to like recover from that hard release and get the tooling up to shape to do things. That turned out okay. Um, uh, I, I think that probably staying on the cadence is something we should keep to. That's a whole another big conversation. Um, yeah, a lot of people were skeptical about this additions idea, which is very fair. Um, it was a big change. Um, I think uh, that idea really worked. We can kind of see as these things go up here, like um, it, it was a hard decision, but I think it has been, you see a lot of growth in the project and that, that, that strategy and approach made things better in the community and made the release a lot more popular. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, this is where, uh, as part of that strategy, we decided to have a, a brochure site, getfedora.org, and we we're going to also have something that went hand in hand with this, a contributor-focused site. That was going to be a thing called Fedora Hubs. The idea was um, there were like 1,100 IRC text chat meetings every year and a lot of stuff on mailing lists. But if you looked at our website and everything that maybe somebody who is n new to the project might come and look, it looked like we were dead. It looked like there was no activity on the internet happening because you know the internet had changed from being something that was a lot of these different text-based protocols to you know the web and social media and those kind of things were really uh, becoming the focus of what people thought was the internet. And so the pro we project didn't really show up. So we wanted to have kind of a social media e view of showing all the activity. Um, that turned out to not work so well, um, but um, that's um, another talk. But um, we kind of come back to that idea later of making sure that the project is visible and uh, activity is surfaced. Um, Josh Boyer says that he was th to blame for killing the names here, but really, um, so we stopped having the fun code names. Uh, the reason is we were coming up with these lists with these tenuous links. We would take them to legal. They would review the you know, 10 candidates and say, these two that are the worst possible ones, you can use one of those. And then that was like, we were using up quite a lot of legal resources on that. So finally we decided, okay, that's, it's not, it, it's fun, but it's not worth it for that. We have to find our fun in other places, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, um, I mentioned that the board wasn't really working. Um, it, not just that it wasn't very active, but um, it wasn't very connected to the project. So we had made this you know, three editions decision. The board actually approved that. We went through this whole process of that. Um, and then at the flock conference a little bit later, we were in a room like this, and a lot of people were like, no one made that decision. That wasn't official, and like it was supposed to be official. Um, so, like that, like clearly, when you have a community-led project, a community-driven project, you can't have top-down decisions that just declare things. It's got to be something that's connected in, and people need to understand. Okay, here we have, you know, we have a process for decision making. The decision has been made, and it wasn't really working very well. So we came up with a new uh, structure called Fedora Council. Um, it maybe also could use some improvement, but I think it's worked pretty well where it tries to draw people who are involved in different areas of the project into leadership and to have a more active, um, not just a um, behind the scenes governance and dispute um, resolution, but actually active involvement in, in, in leadership in the project. Um, we also got rid of the exclusive veto for the Fedora project leader by going to a consensus model where effectively everybody has an equal veto on something and we have to figure out how to all get along on things, which actually has worked very well. We have never gotten to a difficult situation where we haven't been able to reach a consensus. Um, oh, how to do consensus, that's a whole other talk I would love to do, but um, again, I'm actually running way over my time here because I am going much slower than I was going to. Um, one thing we did add, um, we have a thing called the F-Cake, the Fedora Community action and impact coordinator. That is something Robin set up and is one of the reasons I've been able to be Fedora project leader for so long. It is no longer just one person isolated. There's a kind of so another full-time person to help um, with community building and activities in the project, which is um, very, very, very helpful. Um, yeah, um, I can talk also about why that's not called community manager and a whole other talk, which I will not do right now. Um, 
change things up. Fedora uh, KDE Plasma desktop here. Um, got a diversity and inclusion advisor. I think that's a thing. Um, I would like that to be a fully paid role. I can't convince Red Hat to do it. If anybody else can come up with funding for this, I would love to have that be a fully paid role. Um, yeah, a lot of things going on here. I'm going to go here. Uh, XFE, XFCE spin here. Um, a little bit of working in marketing. Fedora loves Python here. Um, one of the things that happened around here, though, I would have the, the docs team kind of got into a situation where it turned out where we hadn't been paying attention, and one person had become the docs team and was, had all the docs team knowledge and docs team work, and that person got burned out, and suddenly we didn't have a functioning docs team in the project. And again, this is not that person's fault. It was something where structurally, like it was going along so well, um, we weren't really paying attention and giving them the support and the team the support that they needed. Um, so uh, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, here it was a really short release cycle. This is something we decided on purpose because previously when a release had drifted, we decided, we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll go six months from now to the next release. And that was causing releases to rotate all around the calendar and be unpredictable. So we decided, well, we're going to stick to the fall, the October, May uh, release cycle and even though that this will be short, um, it turned out to be an okay release. Despite that, there wasn't a lot of change, so that all worked out well. Um, and people actually really liked this one. It got a lot of really good press, which was very encouraging to people who kind of went through those awkward teenage years. You can see in the graph here, there's a big upshoot there. Kind of, I think, the things we were working on, people started to take notice and be like, hey, this is interesting things going on in Fedora these days. Um, Peter Robinson, I have you name dropped here. Uh, you said you made yourself redundant for secondary architectures. We got rid of this idea of having a whole other process for some of these other architectures and kind of merged that into the main thing. Maybe I have the list right this time. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, all right. I got the list right, too, so that works out. Um, I, this is, I think, my favorite wallpaper. I, it's beautiful. Um, this is actually not my voice print. It's the designer, uh, Kyle Conway, saying Fedora in a voice print of that, and then that becomes the trees. I, that's just nice. Um, and it looks pretty. Um, we got a new mission statement. I'm not going to harp on that too much, but I think it kind of goes back in a lot of ways to that thing about spins and where we try to make it so you can, you can as Fedora as a project, we want to make something you can use as an end user, but we also want to make it easy for people with ideas about how to make an OS, how to make things better, to work on those ideas and deliver those to people. Um, it goes yeah, uh, from Fedora Next, rather than just like handing out a bunch of building blocks, um, we, also, we want to give out some pre-assembled things, but we also want to give people those building blocks and like, hey, you can make your Lego set and give that to people. That's um, something that we try to empower as a project. Um, Modularity is its whole another uh, retrospective talk. I'm not even going to touch it. Um, we finally got MP3 playback. Um, patents, uh, software patents are a huge impediment to free software. Um, our basic um, tactic is to wait them out, which is um, not, not a great way, but we actually waited this one out, so there we go. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the modularity thing was a little bit of a stress. Um, this was. Um, we, this release took took way too long, um, or the previous release took way too long. We made this one short again. Um, modularity was really the fire here, and again, that's another talk here. But um, yeah, uh, this is sugar on a stick, which is um, a, a user interface designed for children to be intuitive. It's actually kind of amazing because you put this front in front of an adult, and they're like, "I don't understand how to computer anymore." And you put this in front of like a four-year-old, and they're like, "Whoa!" And so it's 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 actually it's great. Um, yeah. Uh, this is another we broke the laptop screen wallpaper. I, I don't know why we keep doing that. Um, so this is actually the first ever perfect execution of our planned release schedule. We were um, ex you know, exactly on time. Um, and the modularity thing actually landed, so that was nice. Um, part of the trick here was dropping alpha releases. So um, quality team, a lot of work around that. Um, ben Cotton as program manager, I think gets a lot of credit here as well. Um, and uh, less good here, we had somebody who had been you know, working on the websites team who over time became the websites team and had kind of felt you know, he had ownership of everything. And once again, like he was doing such an amazing job with it that we didn't really pay attention to that. And uh, when he got a different day job, suddenly we didn't have a websites team and uh, it 
turned out that when I went to Red Hat and said, hey, um, can you, we, need to, we need a website people, and they were like, no, that's not important for RHEL. Um, so that was a whole crisis about how are we going to have a, a nice, pretty website. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, it turns out that um, uh, this should be a, a whole a, another thing. We actually have a nicely revitalized community-built websites team that made a beautiful new website. If you go to fedoraproject.org now, it's amazing. And that was really done by you know, building together a community of volunteers interested in doing this. So we're getting better at this, but we certainly had this problem over and over and over again. Um, I love this wallpaper. It's cool. Um, uh, one of the big things here, Red Hat surprised everybody by buying CoreOS, the company. Um, they didn't know what to do with CoreOS, the Linux distribution. Um, and so I fought pretty hard to have that uh, Fedora be a home for that, and I'm glad that it did. If you look at the statistics in a different talk, come, come to Flock, our next conference. I'll show you some statistics. Fedora CoreOS is doing really well. Um, and from now on, at least through, through this talk, um, we're basically 180 days apart release to release, um, very, very consistently. Plus or minus one, I think, here. Um, Fedora Silver Blue came out around this time, and based on the CoreOS technology, um, which kind of showed that you don't have to just, you, you don't, it doesn't have to be just a trivial change of packages. Um, Adam, you're making a face. What have I done? You didn't do anything with oh. oh, we didn't? Um, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, uh, the idea is basically you can make a big change to make in a spin. It doesn't have to be just a different desktop technology and package in the same way. You can change how the, dis the OS is put together in, in fundamental ways and also have a Fedora spin that shows that. So I think that's a big fundamental thing. Okay, um, running out of time, kind of move on. We drop the 32-bit uh, x86, that's a big thing, not enough people to maintain it. Um, this is a cool release. Um, I feel like that's like a really nice 80s throwback wallpaper there. Um, uh, yeah, there's plenty of other stuff, but um, big highlight that Lenovo decided that they would ship uh, Fedora Linux on, you know, you could buy it out of the box with that. And one of the amazing things about this is, first of all, if we didn't go to Lenovo to make a deal, they came to us because of custom, customer demand. And more than that, uh, they didn't want us to make a customized version. They didn't want a customized version. They wanted exactly what Fedora as a community was producing with no changes. They wanted the real Fedora Linux, not some sort of Lenovoized version. They didn't want to take control over the kernel. They wanted to deliver to their users what we are making. So that was a really strong vote of confidence and um, a really nice way to work there. Um, there's been a whole bunch of supply chain problems and COVID and whatever that, and there's still not as, it's not available as much as it should be, but um, you know, uh, call Lenovo and ask for this, and because that's really uh, the salespeople hearing it is what's ca causing it not to be available worldwide. Um, yeah, COVID times, we had Nest instead of Flock, um, virtual meeting, everything. I was actually kind of dreading that um, thing, but it actually turned out that our virtual conference turned out to be amazing and energizing, and um, I didn't organize it, so I can say this. Um, it was the best conference of all of COVID, all of the nests. They were, uh, most of the things I went to, um, you know, Red Hat Summit, sorry, Red Hat Summit people, were just kind of draining and awful. Um, uh, it, it, what, and the, you know, at, at the best, they were like, oh, here's a webinar. And our conferences really felt like the community coming together from around the world and having a virtual party. Um, and I, that was amazing. So um, again, Fedora community is wonderful. Uh, this you know, is the Peaceful Universe wallpaper, I think, Escaping the Stress. I, that was a nice one. There's a night version of that. Um, here's a case where GNOME 40, um, remember back to where we lost all the users. This is a really big user interface change, changing things from horizontal to vertical or the other way around. Um, and I think uh, both Fedora and GNOME Upstream learned a lot from this and actually spent a lot of time doing actual user interviews and research before putting the change out there. Um, and actually, you know, the results ended up being great. And I was, I was worried. I thought there would be drama there. Um, and it turned out to be, you know, a, some people aren't perfectly pleased, but you're never going to make everybody happy. And I think the, the big change landed very smoothly. Um, Pipewire, uh, a big audio change landed. You know, there's a little bit of rough there as well. But this was actually a 
funny marketing lesson, which is obvious in retrospect, which is um, a lot of people shouldn't ever care about their audio subsystem, but there's one set of people who care a whole lot, and that is YouTubers and podcasters. And suddenly, around this release, we were incredibly popular with YouTubers and podcasters who had an exciting thing to talk about, and they really liked that, and so that kind of jumped up how people were talking about us. So it's like, oh yeah, maybe appealing to the um, audiences that talk a lot about what they're doing is a way to get people to talk a lot about things. That was it. Um, uh, and we also have our new logo here. Um, Mo Duffy does a great talk about why we have a new logo and how the designing went into that. Um, I really like it, and I'm glad that it now um, will not have Fedoro as one of the top um, typos um, or searches from people who don't recognize, in languages where they don't recognize this as a word, assume that that's what the old logo said because it had an A, it was very indistinguishable from an O at the end. Uh, yeah, um, okay, so um, up at the time, you know, best release ever, Fedora Linux 35. Um, this is the new overview, the new um, sideways instead of vertical thing. Um, we didn't quite make the 182 days there, so I guess more than plus or minus one, but still reasonable range. Got things right instead of rushing. Um, and here, um, some of the big changes that are not there, uh, we uh, launched the chat.fedoraproject.org, moving from IRC to Matrix, and working on uh, discussion.fedoraproject.org. I, I know some people are very resistant, but I want to move as much mailing list stuff from there to that as well. So a modern, friendly interface that um, is transparent to people who are not necessarily uh, deeply involved in the project. I also want to make sure that people who are deeply involved have a good experience, so we'll work on that transition. It's not going to be dumped on people, but I think that's actually a really important thing. Uh, we also have a renewed Fedora Ambassadors program around this time. That's kind of getting ramped up after COVID. Um, we're working on some investments in mentoring, had a mentor summit. Uh, I think that was a exciting thing. Um, and uh, this website, new websites team that I talked about started coming together as well. And that was really uh, with kind of lessons learned on how to make this a team success rather than something that could be, it was just an individual. I think that was really, really good. Um, uh, yeah, um, right there, uh, Kino White was somewhere around there. So we started having some different variants uh, using the OS tree um, that were coming around. Uh, is that, was that in this release here? Kino White, was that, is there? Um, um, yeah, so um, I, I was asked at the beginning, where's the net missing three releases? So uh, I started adding on to here, but I realized I didn't really have the perspective to talk about these most recent releases. So um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's interesting things to say. A lot of stuff has happened in the last you know, year or so, um, but I'm decided I'm gonna put the seal on this talk here and end it, and then maybe in you know, 15 years, someone else can do a sequel and talk about what's happened over the time there, um, but that's, uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop this here. Uh, so quickly, um, some of the hard-earned lessons. What, what should we not repeat? Um, you need to find a balance when you're making big changes. Um, you can't just document it away. You've gotta make sure you're listening to users and you've got to, um, you gotta make room for mistakes, but you also have to listen and deliver what people want. Um, but also having a community that cares about the project and is you know, working together, um, it can make the rough parts actually functional. Okay, I'm running out of time for questions. Um, yeah, community teams, you need to have momentum to serve, to keep going long term. Got to make sure that you're watching the people who are you know, in, in positions where they can be a bottleneck so that they don't, don't uh, become. Don't use, li this is one of the official fedora colors, so that's there. There we go, tune to that. Um, yeah, <laughs> don't, um, yeah. Um, we've gotta make sure that our teams are, ha have, you know, uh, they're not just depending on one person, that people should feel like they're recognized and awesome and supported, but that they also, if they want to go do something else, they can and the thing they're working on will continue and that should be a pride of success. Um, and going kind of back to the thing that I talked about, um, Red Hat, you know, letting, letting go and letting the Fedora community lead um, really has brought a lot of innovation into the project. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of projects really could learn from. It's scary to do it that way. Sometimes it's hard when you have, you know, to w figure out how to get a community to come along with the decision that you want to happen, but you get better results that way. 
And okay, there, um, I have left some time for questions here. So let's, uh, all right, Peter Robinson, is it about how I've gotten the architectures wrong? No. <laughs> I want to know why you left out the first new edition. The first? New edition after I, the edition process. What release was that in? Yeah, uh, it says Fedora IoT. I think I mentioned it somewhere there, but I may have just skipped over it. Fedora IoT is an important addition that we added, kind of one of these use cases that we thought, oh, we need to make sure we have something that covers this emerging area in technology. So um, that's a very that's important a thing. Actually yeah, and actually going through the idea of adding a new edition made us um, come up with a how do we add a new edition process, which we had not had before, so we have that as well. Um, yeah, uh, that, that was the thing. I Dan? Would, I would have talked, you know, when we switched to CP3 too, I think that was a, this, was that for us all the other issues? Yeah, right, uh, so uh, there's another big change. We switched to something called C groups uh, V2, which is like a kind of kernel level thing that's used for making containers be containery. Um, I was almost gonna say containers contain, but then I remembered that I got Dan in this room, so I <laughs> shouldn't say that. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, um, and that was, that was a big change that uh, it, it uh, along with the system D and those things, it's one of the situations where if you, uh, if no one takes that first step, it's never going to actually get exposed to users and it will never get there and things will drag on forever. So at some point, you've got to make that change. And so finding that balance of when to go to that and when to not is, uh, is important. And I think having, in some ways, like the additions split where I think, what was CoreOS slower in that? Some some of the additions decided to do that. Yeah, right. So some of the some of the some of the releases uh, decided, okay, we won't make this big change right away, and kind of rolled it out slowly, so that people had the option. It, it was it was the default in a lot of things, but there were also fallbacks um, where you say, okay, this was is going to just work. I yeah. Oh, well, so, so actually that joke, that joke, yeah, why did, fun, why did, I, I did, I skipped over landing my joke here. I've done, in other versions, I landed the joke properly, um, but I was, I had spent too much time on other things here. Yeah, so there's actually several other times it's mentioned. We actually considered ButterFS throughout the years, and every time it was going to be two years off. Um, and then, and at, at between Red Hat storage internally, this is actually one of these, uh, let the community do things. Things Red Hat storage people have decided we're, we're not going to wait for this anymore. We've got to focus on you know uh, what what works, and so they put all their effort into a thing called Stratus, built on LVM and XFS, and so on to kind of give the same kind of features there. Um, people in the community uh, were very excited about things uh, ButterFS could bring. Uh, people coming uh, working in with at Meta. Uh, where they have a bunch of big investment in ButterFS, finally said, okay, look, it's ready, Let, let's do it. And so we went through our change process and with a lot of debate and with the Red Hat storage team weighing in to say, please don't do this, um, we decided, you know what, we've been considering this for years and years, it kind of brings some neat things that we'd, our users would like to see, we're gonna do it. And this is again a thing where, um, you know, uh, Red Hat doesn't call the shots and so, uh, uh, the Red Hat, you know, for four things like that, um, they figure out how that Fedora can be a good upstream and still have uh, different decisions on some fundamental engineering things. But yeah, um, we, uh, we eventually did make, make the decision to do that. Um, another one that's kind of along the same lines uh, is a change in baseline architecture, which is basically as new CPUs come out, they get new and new, newer and newer features. And so if you compile your code with a newer CPU, it can have you know, better performance, but won't run on the older systems. And so uh, Red Hat for RHEL wants to update to the newer version of that. But we have an ironic problem in Fedora where because we move fast, we can't move as fast on some things because we leave people behind. So with RHEL, since it's got a long life cycle, if people can't use the next release on their hardware, of their old hardware, that's fine. They'll keep running the old release for, you know, as long as they want to pay for it being supported. Like, I don't I think there's like probably real four out there somewhere being paid for by somebody, right? Um, 
you know, Red Hat will take your money. Uh, but Fedora, we're, we're kind of going on to the new thing, and we can't say, okay, well, sorry, um, your, all your hardware from five years ago, put it in the trash, buy new computers. So we had to move more slowly. And so the, one of the things uh, I actually asked the, I, I, we, we were, when the people at Red Hat who were working on this uh, were like, well, Fedora will never accept this. And I asked them to bring it to the community anyways to discuss it, which we did. And, um, and you know, it was, a big, it was a big discussion, but out of that, we kind of came up with this idea of having something called ELN, which is a build of Fedora which, with uh, defaults that are set for what would become the next rel. So we actually have a place in Fedora where people can experiment with, here is a way to do things in a different way. So we can do those builds even if we don't make that the mainline thing that we deliver to people. Um, and, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, Red Hat is special in order to do that because they're paying for a lot of the resources to do that. But if anybody else wants to come along with a thing like that and can help provide resources so we can do it, you, uh, Fedora is open to that. So if you've got some other big idea you want to do, uh, Intel, if you would like to do your clear Linux thing as a Fedora build, come to us. We, could, we can make that happen. Uh, Yeah. Uh, what do you see as being the next big technical change for the Fedora project? What is the big next big technical change for the Fedora project? Um, it, predicting the future is hard. Um, I, I think it, it's both a technical change and something that is going to be a kind of a social change. I think that this RPM OS tree approach that's used in Silverblue, Kinoite, CoreOS, IoT, I think that's the, uh, the way we want to go for all of our operating, all of our defaults at least. It has a lot of advantages for delivering a system that's consistent. Uh, you can do cool things like do a bisect to find out exactly where a problem um, came from. Uh, and it kind of goes towards a, uh, container-focused separation of what, you know, what is the base OS and what are your different applications and help solve the problem we are trying to solve with modularity, which is that everybody has different opinions about the speed that they want different parts of their operating system to go. And this kind of, th that, that approach lets you separate things in a way that lets you do that. So I think that change towards that um, in whatever form it'll take is probably the next, the really big technical change. Um, there's also the social change of convincing everybody that that's the right way to do it. Um, the rollbacks are great. Yeah. 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 yeah, rollbacks are great was a comment there. So, yeah. um, my question about CentOS 3 becoming a uh, faster and distro, do you think it makes sense for my team to switch, to try to switch to Fedora for a production workload for the critical services uh, on the cloud uh, to Fedora? Yeah. Uh, but uh, we would like to have a strong community behind it, the distro community, as the next phase, you know, for the next eight years. Do you think it makes sense to consider for us to switch to Fedora? Yeah, so the question is basically uh, with the changes in CentOS project, uh, would Fedora make sense as a cloud server operating system in actual production? And you know, I can't necessarily speak to your particular use cases. Um, there are hopefully reasons, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, Red Hat pays my salary. Um, I hope that there's value that Red Hat's providing that for, for that money. But I also think that, uh, yeah, Fedora can be used in production and people are using it in production in some pretty large scale things. Um, depending on you know your ability to work with the community on things, your tolerance for risk, and your 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 configuration and setup, uh, your change management processes, uh, yeah, you can definitely use Fedora in production for things like that. Okay. We can talk later more about it, your, about your specifics as well. Does that does that cover what you're saying? Asking or does that cover what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask if it's a crazy idea. It's not crazy. Um, yeah. Um, or maybe maybe it's crazy in a good way. I mean, the right kind of crazy, it can make it really work, I guess. But we'll talk. Okay, I'm out of time here. But uh, thank you, everybody.